So I'll try to keep it short, since of course you're not here to listen to me, but instead you're of course here to listen to Richard, and I know that if you're in for a treat, since I've actually heard him speak, of course, quite some times. But just in short, so Richard actually did his undergraduates in Cambridge, and then went on to do his PhD in Sussex. But one little known fact for most people is that actually after his PhD, Richard kind of became disillusioned with science and left science. So he actually started working for the British Museum as well as for BBC, but luckily for all of us, else the field would probably not be where it is right now, he then heard of the place cells that John O'Keefe found. And this finding inspired him to go back into science and to take a position in St. Andrews. And once again, we were quite lucky because he was actually placed into the marine biology labs. And so every day when he would walk past to his office, he would walk past many aquariums, which you can now speculate may have induced some ideas, which resulted in many of us having the joy of throwing rats into pools. <laughs> now, the, um, so one thing about the pools, um, which I think, because if you know Richard, he actually, one of his great talents is that he can tell great anecdotes. And I was allowed that I could say one of them. And I'm, of course, not going to be as good as he is because he does them with beautiful Scottish uh, and, and English accents, which I will not even attempt to do. But there is one really funny story about the milk powder. So we nowadays, when we want to do a water maze, we actually use liquid, um, um, uh, liquid latex to make it opaque so you can't see the platform. However, back in the days, it was still milk powder. And of course, because you do it every day, you use up a lot of milk powder. So Richard had this great idea and said, wait, there is this idea of sponsorship. So he wrote to this milk powder company telling them, you know, I really love your milk powder. It's the best milk powder because there's no clumping. It really nicely <laughs> fills it. And it's really easy to make my water um, um, more opaque. And so that's why he asked, can you maybe give me a lot of your milk powder, because I do use a lot of it. For that, I'm really happy to acknowledge my papers that it's your company that's providing the milk powder. He waits a bit. A few weeks later, a huge package of lots and lots of milk powder arrives, and a little letter saying, thank you for this compliment. Here's the milk powder, but please never, ever acknowledge us in one of your papers. <laughs> And so, yes, um, we went on, so the water maze was invented. And, ah, yeah, water maze, as I've already had to tell editors, is one word, not two, and it's called the water maze, not the Morris water maze, according to Richard. Um, but at least, um, this was, of course, not his only accomplishment. He went on to do the synaptic tagging and capture theory, which you're going to hear, hear about probably today, and also then thinking about schemas and the idea of finally bringing the idea of previous knowledge networks and that actually... Well, animals are usually not naive when they go into tasks um, into neuroscience. And of course, all these achievements led to lots of prizes. I won't even list um, all of them, there's so many. But just some two key ones, for example, is that the Brain Prize, which he recently got, and another, for me as a non-British, a very quirky kind of thing, is that Richard is actually the commander of the British Empire, so a CBE. <laughs> and I've been told that if he would get one level higher in these honors, he would be Sir, and we were not allowed to call him anything else but Sir until he tells us, and he would be allowed to have a sword. <laughs> I sadly didn't have my time in the uh, institute. But this was already enough, because as I said, you're not here to hear me. For those, actually, because of course maybe some have already left, you want to share these great talks um, with your colleagues, there is a great trick, because Richard, very luckily last year, actually recorded a TED talk, which I can warmly recommend. And while um, I did not understand the Spanish that you spoke, my uh, Irene, my uh, Spanish postdoc, told me that your Spanish has improved markedly and you're now very good um, at making Spanish jokes. With that, <laughs> Richard Morris. Well, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Lest, lest you think being a commander of the British Empire is a great honor, I must explain that it consists basically of Gibraltar and the island of St. Helena in the South Pacific. That's basically all we have left, I think. <laughs> so um, all the other speakers here have, of course, thanked the organizers, uh, Jim McGaw, Gary Lynch, and others. Um, well, 
I've wondered about doing that, but I want to do it in the context of this famous remark of Amos Tversky. You waste years by not being able to waste hours. So Mike, thanks for wasting my time. That's great. And Jim too. I've wasted lots of hours this week. And uh, I hope that they have been constructive. And I certainly feel that. I've been challenged by all sorts of new ideas, lots of conversations, and um, I uh, can already know that I will go back and not do a particular experiment I was planning to do. So, uh, <laughs> so that's, that's good. Right. So we've heard about lots of different aspects of memory, uh, memory for the past, imagination of the future, and so on. But of course, it's not just us scientists who write about that, uh, novelists, poets as well. So let's begin with a poem. And it's a very famous poem. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past. But then Eliot goes on to go beyond mental time travel into imagination, because what he then goes on to say is what might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present, footfalls echo in the memory down the passage, which we did not take towards the door we never opened into the rose garden. My words echo thus in your mind, but to what purpose disturbing the dust on a bowl of rose leaves? I do not know. Wonderful words, but one of the most famous poems of the English language. So, as Jim was saying, memory is everything. We're all interested in memory. Our families are interested in memory. Our friends and novelists, artists, and so on. Now, there are lots of ways of kind of conceiving of it, but one which is almost the kind of standard textbook idea of a taxonomy of memory systems introduced originally by Larry Squire by the diagram that's been changed over the years, distinguishes short-term and long-term memory. And the idea is that information is represented in different ways in these systems and then further divides into non-declarative, declarative, and emotional memory. And we all draw this diagram in some ways, um, but I've got a particular interest in the declarative part of this, and I think that it's insufficient to just think of it as episodic and semantic memory. I do not think that spatial memory can be subsumed into those two categories. And I also think that the representation of goals in actions is a declarative kind of statement, but somehow actions through their repetition become habits. So my little diagram is slightly different. But be that as it may, I think there's another orthogonal set of memory processes we have to think about, um, and those have to do with the encoding information into these memory systems, storage, consolidation, and retrieval. And what I'd like to do with you today is the data from three studies one to do with making of memories, which I shall call silent learning. The second to do with keeping of memories. And there are two studies, novelty associated enhancement of memory and schematic memory. So let's get going. So what is the place of cell firing and neuronal plasticity in memory processing in the hippocampus? So a kind of starting point uh, is perhaps to think of cell firing as necessary for representing information in spatiotemporal patterns. And thus, I think we would probably all take the view that it's essential for memory retrieval, whether it's retrieving an index, as Bruce has been talking about, or the more detailed information that may be stored in cortex. But what of neuronal plasticity? Well, it's critical for altering the probability of cell firing and via synaptic plasticity for storing information as change patterns of synaptic weights within a distributed associative memory system, which we think the hippocampus is. And so plasticity is thought to be essential for a new memory trace encoding. Now, if we look at that from the point of view of a simplified version of the hippocampal circuit, here in a diagram which I show courtesy of Menno Witter, We've got a number of different structures with different kinds of architecture. And Bruce was saying there's sparse coding, there's also plasticity. 
And somehow, through that combination of properties, the dentate gyrus is able to contribute to pattern separation of information arriving at the hippocampus. Area CA3 adds through pattern completion and also perhaps the encoding of sequences, which transforms events. And then finally, there's the possibility of event context associations. Now, there are lots of aspects of this diagram which others have talked about in much more detail. Like for the purposes of the experiment I want to present to you now, to draw your attention to a particular feature of the circuitry. Notice that layer two of the entorhinal cortex has a monosynaptic input to the dentate gyrus, it has a monosynaptic input to area CA3, and that layer three of the entorhinal cortex has a monosynaptic input to area CA1. Now this may be relevant to the experiment I want to describe, I don't know, but I think that we're used to thinking of this as a circuit that's processing information. People sometimes talk about a trisynaptic circuit, an idea that I think is a little bit outdated. But nonetheless, there is the potential for cortical information to affect the hippocampal circuitry at all levels through monosynaptic connections. So let's try to see if we can work towards some kind of definitive behavioral dissociation between memory encoding and memory retrieval. And I put it to you that a key step for identifying a memory encoding process is to ensure that any test of the impact of a manipulation that putatively infects encoding is conducted after the physical effects of that manipulation are over. It can't be during it, because then there'd be an ambiguity. And with respect to memory retrieval, a key step is to ensure that the test of memory retrieval occurs under circumstances in which the memory encoding either fails to occur or is unlikely to affect measurement of retrieval per se. In that way, we can divide the two apart. Okay, so let's go straight to the experiment. So in this experiment, we implanted bilateral cannulae into the dorsal hippocampus and infused a variety of drugs, artificial CSF, DAPV, CNQX, and now, a key aspect of this experiment is that the dose of muscimol we used was extremely low, 0.19 nanomolar. And at that dose, what you can see, as shown in the orange symbols here, that's not great, but panel A in the top left, you can see that there's a small effect on the EPSP, but nothing very much, but that the cells completely stop firing. And they stop firing for about two hours until they rise back up to baseline and the effects of the drug wear off. In the case of AP5, what we have is a small perturbation of the EPSP, slightly longer lasting effect on the population spike. That's been reported many times before. And in the case of CNQX, we have a massive disturbance of the EPSP and of the cell firing. So the, each of the drugs is behaving in a slightly different way. But the particular point I want to draw your attention to is that even with this incredibly low dose of muscimol, the cells stop firing for two hours. Now, what happens with LTP induction? Well, so here you could use any point in the circuit, but we chose to look at the perforant path. And you can see in panel E at the bottom on the left, with artificial CSF, you get perfectly decent LTP. With APV shown in red, LTP is blocked. Great, nothing new there. But I guess the puzzle is that at this low dose of muscimol, LTP is intact. So the EPSPs are slightly smaller, but even though the cells are not firing, LTP occurs. So, Let's just look at that in a slightly enlarged image. We have to recalibrate the baseline a bit, but in fact, it turns out that the amount of LTP that you get in this muscimol condition is equal to that with artificial CSF. So now we turn to our old friend, the water maze, because we're now gonna use these drugs in this task, and I thought I'd better just show you a movie of how the apparatus is in my lab in Edinburgh. Here's Hannah putting in a well-trained rat who, um, because he's on television, swims straight to the platform. 
And then it's an Atlantis platform, which is on a spindle, goes down to an electromagnet at the bottom, which we can control. And now we run a probe test, which of course is never done during training, um, only done once at the end of training in this particular protocol. And I hope persuaded that this animal does actually succeed in swimming back and forth across the place where he might find some safety. Now this is for a very well-trained rat. In the protocol that I'm going to present to you, he doesn't do quite as well as this, but he nonetheless does show a spatial bias. And then we release the platform to within two centimeters of the water surface, and the animal can then climb onto it. The Atlantis platform is quite a powerful adjunct to the apparatus. Now, just to make clear, this animal can't see the platform, he can't hear the platform, he can't feel it till he gets to it, so he has to find it in relation to the extra maze cues. So an important addition is that we have white curtains that we can pull round the pool to completely occlude those extra maze cues. And although I won't show it in the further bit of the movie, um, then the animal's performance falls to chance. Now, I should mention that when I moved from St. Andrews to the University of Edinburgh, the uh, States and Buildings Department was somewhat amused by this new member of staff who wanted a sort of rat leisure center in his laboratory. Um, but I also wanted to make the curtains, and my, my um, then wife Hillary went out to a department store, bought lots of material, and, um, and the house was covered in this for the next few days, building this curtain stuff. And at the end, when she'd been working hard producing all of this, she gave me the receipt from John Lewis and asked if I could get some of the money from my grant. So I duly submitted it to the finance office of the University of Edinburgh, and uh, hoped, whatever it was, 50 pounds or something, and um, two weeks later, I got a phone call. And it was a lovely, very polite lady on the phone. And she said, um, is that Dr. Morris? And I said, yes, it is. Um, oh, well, I'm phoning about your curtains. And I said, oh, yes. And she said, well, are you a full professor? And I said, no, 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 no. I'm just a new lecturer at the department. And she said, well, I'm very sorry, but only full professors are allowed curtains. <laughs> so I said, look, you, you, you really don't understand. Um, it's not for me, it's for my rats. <laughs> there was a pause, and then in a lovely Scottish lilt, she replied, oh, well, then, that's OK. <laughs> so. What we're going to do now is a slightly different procedure from the regular one, because I'm wanting to dissect encoding and retrieval. So we've got a series of sessions. In fact, the experiment runs for about 30 sessions. We have the preliminary training for about 10 sessions, and then we get into the interesting bit of the experiment. But on the first trial of the day, which lasts for up to two minutes, the platform is unavailable for 60 seconds. You saw the Atlantis platform. So the animal can swim around. And in the pattern it swims around, it can tell us where he thinks the platform should be. And they tend to swim where it was the day before. So after that, the platform, well, it doesn't appear, but it gets close to the water surface. And then we have a total of four trials to learn the location that day. And you can see it's in the sort of northwest location for session one. We then move the platform for session two down to, say, southwest. And now the animal's given an opportunity to encode the new location of the platform and given a further three trials to really stamp that in. And then session three, a further location. So in this way, each day there's an opportunity for the animal to show by means of retrieval where it thinks the platform may be, where the safety may be, but also the opportunity to encode new information. But that happens afterwards. So... If you look at something like the first crossing latency, I mean, we can't plot escape latency because we don't have a platform but, and, until 60 seconds has gone by, but you can see nice um, curves showing that the animal takes a certain amount of time to cross the platform the area first time. It's about a minute as it happens. And then um, the performance is radically better for the next two or three trials. So effectively, there's one trial episodic like spatial encoding going on here. But let's look a little bit more detail on what we're going to try and measure. So the platform location 
on session one is at a particular position, and we're going to measure the amount of time spent in a zone around that platform location for session one. Then on, along comes session two the next day, and now, as I've said to you, the platform moves to a new location. Now, what do the animals do? Well, if they've got just artificial CSF or no drug at all, they tend to swim across the red area, not the black area, because they're remembering from the previous day. So then you go on to session three. Now, again, they swim across the red area, which is now in a new location, and not the black one, but the black one is what they will learn for that particular day. Okay, so now let's come to the critical results. So with artificial CSF, where the chance performance is 4%, they're at about 8, 9, maybe 10%, uh, with a very tight standard error. They're remembering yesterday's location all the way through. Now with AP5, what happens is what you'd expect would happen, which is that on session two, the animals have absolutely no difficulty in remembering where the platform was the previous day, they can retrieve information. But when you check them on session three, when the drug on session two is worn off, it's intrahippocampal AP, then they have no memory of where the platform was on session two. They're being tested on session three in the absence of the drug. CNQX, they're bad on session two and session three. That's uninteresting. The interesting result is the muscovol result. So with this low-dose muscovol, you remember I showed to you that the cells don't fire for two hours. So on session two, if that cell firing is necessary for memory retrieval, showing a representation of where the animal should go, you would expect the animal to perform at chance, and indeed he does. But if you now come back on session three the following day and ask them where was the platform on session two when you couldn't represent what was happening, they show that they have learned it perfectly successfully. And that would be compatible with the idea that LTP was intact at this dose of muscomol, even though the cells couldn't fire. So I'd like to think of this as kind of silent learning. And um, we can actually look closely at the paths. I won't take you through this in detail. But if you look at the row for muscomol, the silent learning row, you can see that on session two, the animal swims all over the place. But on session three, he focuses search at the position where the platform was on session two. Now, you can also look at memory updating because if successful encoding occurs of where it is each day, that's likely to overwrite the recently retrieved earlier memory. And therefore, the prediction would be that with artificial CSF and muscomol, when tested on session three for how well they remember session one's location, they're really bad. But for APV and CNQX, they remember where it was on session one, not where it was on session two. So the data is all consistent. So the finding here is that low-dose muscomol blocks somatic cell firing while leaving synaptic transmission largely intact and long-term potentiation unaffected. Now, what might be going on? Well, I'm not sure. It's ongoing work in the lab. But let me share with you what I think may be happening is the drug use used may spare back-propagating dendritic spikes and plateau potentials in the hippocampus. So, if that's the case, then we need to perhaps look just for a moment at the old Hub postulate. When an axon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B, or repeatedly or consistently take part in firing, at some growth process or metabolic change takes place in one or both cells, such that A is... Now, we've known for some while that while this is a lovely kind of firing together, wiring together idea, um, it may not be absolutely necessary for those postsynaptic cells to fire. Indeed, if we look at the properties of the NMDA receptor, uh, the fact that they've got this dual ligand and voltage gating uh, mediated by the magnesium in the ion channel, then McNaughton's cooperativity principle uh, requires only that there's sufficient postsynaptic depolarization to occur to allow the NMDA receptors to function. Now, in 2002, Nelson Spruston published a paper indicating that dendritic spikes could be a mechanism for cooperative long-term potentiation. And the kind of experiment he did, there's lots of figures in the paper, included applying TTX very close to the soma and then doing an LTP experiment out in 
uh, stratum lacunosum moleculari, and you can see in panel C that whether you have the TTX present or absent, the amount of LTP induced is just the same. And on the basis of that and the other data presented in the paper, he suggested that maybe somatic firing is not necessary and that we should focus more attention on dendritic spikes. In fact, he wrote in that paper that although we use somatic TTX application or hyperpolarization to prevent action potential initiation propagation, a similar situation may occur in vivo if the soma is inhibited while the dendrites are excited. Indeed, during hippocampal theta rhythm, the distal dendrites are excited by glutamate-mediated synaptic potentials, which can trigger dendritic spikes at a time when the soma is inhibited by GABA. And he goes on. Now, there are a whole number of other papers that have been published since that time. Spruston himself went on and published a 2007 paper in which he showed that dendritic spikes uh, are sufficient to induce single burst long-term potentiation. And a couple of recent papers, Sheffield about the prevalence of calcium transients across the dendritic arbor during place field formation, and a new concept of behavioral time scale synaptic plasticity uh, that Jeff McGee has described. And a nice review from Jackie Schiller from Israel on the many worlds of plasticity rules. So um, I readily concede that you know, muscimol is absolutely no model of the exquisite subtlety of inhibition. Um, but nonetheless, it's perhaps a starter here in enabling us to think in a slightly different way about the circumstances that are absolutely required for learning. I'm not suggesting for one moment that cell firing's uh, not important in many cases. I'm sure it is, and I, it, I don't mean to be too strong in this claim. But I think the concept of silent learning, to me, has a sort of intriguing ring about it, which is why shouldn't evolution have allowed a brain area to alter synapses without that brain area having to tell the next brain area that it's done it? So, you know, there's a sort of element of secrecy here <laughs> that's sort of intriguing that you don't have to broadcast that you're learning, you can sort of learn silently, and that may be quite useful as a computational device in the brain. I don't know, just a thought. So, keeping memories. Novelty associated enhancement of every memory and schematic memory, I'll speed up a bit. So there's a lovely phrase in English called, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink, right? You probably have it in American too. Now, it's changed in Britain in the past year uh, to you can take British voters to the polling booth, <laughs> but you cannot make them think. Now, whether British voters are the only voters who can't think in polling booths is not an issue that I would wish to comment upon. But um, anyway, by the same token, you can make a memory, uh, but doing so is no guarantee uh, that it will last. And there are lots of factors in memorability. Attention at the time of memory, encoding is obviously important, reward and spacing, retrieval practice, the Rodiger effect, emotional activation, post-encoding consolidation, triggered by emotional events, the amygdala, the work of Jim McGaw and his colleagues, novelty shortly after uh, or before the moment of memory encoding uh, can play a role, prior knowledge, sleep, and so on. We've all got our favorite things that affect, as it were, the fate of newly encoded information. And I'd just like to touch on a couple of experiments to do with novelty and, and prior knowledge. Now, this is stimulated, of course, by uh, the work I began initially with Julie Fry on the synaptic tagging and capture hypothesis of protein synthesis-dependent long-term potentiation. And we proposed, on the basis of experiments showing that it was possible to induce protein synthesis-dependent LTP in the presence of anisomycin at a dose that successfully blocked protein synthesis, that we have the possibility of an explanation of aspects of memory persistence that's very different from the only strength or spacing matters concept. And the basic idea is, as shown in panel A, that as we go through the day, we're constantly encoding new information. You can't stop it. I could ask any one of you what you had for breakfast today, and you'd be able to tell me. 
And you weren't sitting at breakfast saying, God, I've got to remember that I had bacon and not sausage because Richard Morris is going to test me on my knowledge. Of, you know, it just happens, right? It, this is happening through the day. But my supposition, and I think it's completely consistent um, with a lot of human experiments, is that um, much of that information decays back down to baseline in the course of the day. However, under circumstances in which that encoding happens around the time of the upregulation of plasticity protein synthesis, then there's some kind of stabilization process, a bit like an old-fashioned photographic um, system where you first um, uh, uh, form the, the, the image and then fix it uh, subsequently. And we offered an account in terms of the movement of plasticity proteins in the dendrites. So just to convince you that this is a phenomenon in LTP, for those who you know, are familiar with this, this is some experiments that my then PhD student, Roger Redondo, did in Edinburgh, in which he set up experiments where he could do 12-hour recording with, as you can see, a very stable baseline. This is all done at 32 degrees C in rather careful conditions. And if you give a strong tetanus of three trains at 100 hertz for one second at 10-minute intervals, you get a lovely uh, long-term potentiation. And importantly, um, what we argued in that paper was it wasn't just the amount of LTP, it was the stability of LTP that in our view mattered. So if we measured the amount of LTP at two hours and at 10 hours, it did not differ statistically. Now given that we are conducting our experiments with extracellular recording, the absolute magnitude of LTP may depend upon the number of, uh, uh, of neurons and synapses that you actually activate, but the stability would be relatively unaffected by that. But here we've got clear stability with this strong tetanus. However, if you use a weak tetanus of a theta burst of four trains, five pulses, 100 hertz, in our hands, it always declined to baseline. But you had to run the experiments for long enough to actually see this. If you cut off the experiment at you know, two hours or three hours or four hours, you might persuade yourself that you got LTP with this weak tetanus. In our hands, at any rate, 32 degrees C always declined. But if you, uh, and it was statistically a decline, but if you put those two things together within some window of time, a strong tetanus followed by a weak, now the weak path shows a stable LTP. It's stable from two to 10 hours and statistically. And so our account in the synaptic plasticity idea was that the strong glutamatergic stimulation uh, induces an LTP, but also sets a tag, the little blue things. It through maybe a CAMK4 pathway or through a neuromodulatory coafferents such as dopamine or noradrenaline or something like that, um, there's an upregulation of the synthesis of plasticity proteins. And when the tags and the proteins come together, then you will stabilize these changes in the actin cytoskeleton, which are permissive for new AMP receptors that Gary was talking about yesterday. Now, if you have just weak stimulation as shown in panel B, you don't cross the threshold for the synthesis of the plasticity proteins, and after a period of time, the tag decays back to baseline, as does the LTP. But put those two things together, then the synaptic tag set by a weak stimulation hijack the plasticity proteins induced in response to the strong stimulation, and so enable late LTP. There's a synergistic interaction along certainly at least segments of the dendritic tree that enable that to happen. Under those circumstances, Weakly tetanized pathways can show perfectly long-lasting LTP without any difficulty. So then in collaboration with Haruhiko Bito, in his lab in Tokyo, we set up a culture system to look at the phosphorylation of CAMK2 and the phosphorylation of CREB, and this is just part of a much larger study, and investigated the impact of the CAM kinase inhibitor KN93. And what we see is that it blocks the phosphorylation of CAMK2 at one log unit lower concentration then it blocks the phosphorylation of CREB. And if you look at panel C, you can see the inflection point for the phosphorylation of CAMK2 is around about one micromolar for KN93, but it's shifted up by about an order of magnitude for the phosphorylation of CREB. And this raised in our minds the possibility that perhaps the CAMK2 pathway was critical for tag setting, but not necessarily put the upregulation of plasticity proteins. And that although it's kind of dicey to work with just these titration of doses, nonetheless, perhaps we've got some hope of separating these processes out. So this led us to a study in which we use the strong before weak protocol, but in conjunction with this low dose of KN93. 
So, as in the previous figures, the yellow pathway is our control pathway all through the 12 hours. And now we're going to give a strong tetanization in the presence of a low dose of KN93. Now, what does the synaptic tagging and capture hypothesis predict? It predicts that under those circumstances, if tag setting is downstream of activation of CAMK2, then the tag will not be set. But it may be that plasticity protein synthesis happens nonetheless. But those proteins haven't got a tag they can interact with, and therefore the strongly tetanized red pathway will decay back down to the baseline, provided you monitor things for long enough. So, having done that, you then come along with your third pathway, and now you give the weak tetanus, the theta burst, but having washed out the KN93. Now, this is just the weak one, which is insufficient to upregulate the plasticity proteins, but in our view, above threshold for setting the tag. So, under those circumstances, we predict that the plasticity proteins from the first guy whiz around and bind to the tags for the second guy. And as a consequence of that, we make the strong prediction that the weakly tetanized pathway will show late LTP and the strongly tetanized pathway will fail to do so. And I'm pleased to say that exactly that happens. So here with the strong tetanus in red on the red pathway, you see we get lots of lovely LTP in the first few minutes. And this decays down and crosses the orange pathway, which is the weak one, which shows this nice stability. If you do the thing in the opposite order, you can start with the weak tetanization, but you have to have the KN93 present during the strong tetanization, and once again, they cross over. And this crossover, I think, is quite a rigorous test of this way of thinking about what's going on. Okay, so that's seen for going on to a set of behavioral experiments in which we're going to now use an entirely different apparatus, but essentially the same behavioral tasks that I described to you in the water maze call it the event arena because it's an arena in which events happen, and it's a protocol for examining the changing daily memory in a common context. Sorry. Thanks. So, on day one, we hide a sand well full of food in position um, E1, and then, say an hour later, have a choice test where the animals have to choose which location to go to to get more food, and the same location will provide more food, and the other ones are empty sand wells. On the next day, or generically on day N, the sample will always be in a new position across this 7x7 seven seven grid. We've got 49 different locations we can use, and we always follow it with a choice trial. Now, uh, this can carry on, and we can then vary the interval between the sample trial and the choice trial and use that to titrate how long the memories will last. And importantly, we change the start and goal location across days to try to ensure allocentric spatial representations. So what happens? So imagine we're going to put our sand well in row two, column two, say with just one pellet reward, a very modest reward, so this is going to be a nice weak memory. Um, and then test the animals after 30 minutes or 24 hours. Now, before I share the data with you, I just want to stress that we, uh, by which I mean the guys in the lab uh, and the girls, um, take exceptional care about the way these experiments are run. The sand wells, although simple, consist of a sort of um, ball with lots of holes in it, and at the incorrect sand wells, we've got all the pellets of food hidden underneath that ball, so it's inaccessible food. And in the correct sand well, um, those pellets of food are just above this thing. So the smell coming out of these two sand wells is essentially identical. And you can see that across here, an 80-session experiment with lots of different things happening within it, uh, the performance of the animals is at about 75 to 85%, and it's nice and stable. Let me draw your attention in particular to a control procedure here. Um, and at that control procedure, around about uh, session 60, what we did was we simply ran the choice trial one day without a sample trial. So now in the so choice trial, we've got one sand well, which has got accessible food, and all the rest, it's inaccessible food. They should be smelling the same. 
If they're smelling the same, the animals should fall to chance. And indeed, the animals do fall to chance. So it's a kind of behavioral procedure we build into the experiment to say, are we in control of what we think we're in control of? If so, can we force our animals to go to chance by controlling those very parameters? And indeed, they do. And you can see that. And then they bounce back up. Moreover, we plot inter-observer correlations. And you can see those are quite good. OK, so what happens? Well, if you, as you see in panel D, measure memory by seeing where the animals go and dig in the sand wells after 30 minutes, there's a very strong memory as to the location where the event of digging occurred before and is remembered well. But if you test the animals after 24 hours, that memory has gone. At least it's not measurable. Now, I want to put it to you that that is very similar to what I've been presenting to you as early LTP or the weak tetanus LTP, where you see some change but it decays back down to baseline in the physiological experiment in eight to 10 hours. And notice the similarity in the bar graphs in panel B and in panel D for the behavioral data and the physiological data. Now this event arena is a very well behaved piece of apparatus. It reproduces classical phenomena in the learning literature, in particular, the effect of space training. So, if instead of just doing one encoding trial, you do three encoding trials and you mass them together, then as you can see in panel B, you get lovely forgetting over 24 hours. But if you space the rewards apart, actually at a shorter interval than Gary Lynch was talking about yesterday, in our case, 10 minutes is sufficient, what you see is very good memory 24 hours later. All that's changed between the black and the red conditions here is the spacing of the trials. And this is a classic mass versus space phenomena from training. So this study was done in conjunction with DART Neuroscience uh, in San Diego. And I'm very grateful to uh, Jennifer Lapper and Damien Wheeler, who then did RNA-seq um, on the material from these animals um, having gone through these training procedures. And um, what we see is that there were, uh, on the mass training, a set of 29 genes uh, that could be seen in both hippocampus and retrospinal cortex, a further 16 in hippocampus, a further 53 in retrospinal cortex in the mass condition. But there was additional transcription in hippocampus and retrospinal cortex in the space condition. And when we pull those together, you see the striking difference between the mass versus space in terms of the regulation of transcription. Moreover, what Damien and his colleagues did was to plot the data in which you have the gene induction for the space trial on the vertical axis and the gene induction for the mass condition on the horizontal axis, hippocampus on the left, retrospinal on the right, and pleasingly, the data diverts from the 45-degree position. And uh, while I can't speak for each and every one of the uh, uh, transcripts uh, identified, many of them are Krebs target genes. However, at this point, things took a surprising turn. As I say, the collaboration was uh, with DART Neuroscience, and Nicola Broadbent was running some similar experiments in her laboratory there. And uh, she made the mistake, in my view, of, um, of changing the procedure from what we had told her to do from Edinburgh. But I'm very glad she did, because she discovered something very important. She changed the start location between the sample and the choice trials. Now, imagine an animal starting at south for a sample trial in panel A and starts in the same position in the choice trial. Then what we see in terms of the performance index is performance averaging about 85, 90%, and you can see the performance for each of the animals in the experiment. However, if, we then, if she then changed the start position from south to north, what happened was the performance fell apart. So I had assumed until this point that because we were changing the goal locations and the start locations, the whole thing was being done as an allocentric representation. But what seems to have been happening is that the animals, as they shuttle back and forth collecting the reward, were actually doing path integration and working out where the sand well was uh, in relation to the start box 
by carrying the food back to the start box, eating it, going back to get some more, and they were allowed to do this three times. So the whole thing was being done by path integration. And in the classic work of Ian Wishore on this phenomenon, um, uh, he, and McNaughton's own, own model of what might be going on here, this constitutes a mechanism, perhaps uh, some initial calibration of the place cells that might be representing this environment. So we then made a key change in the way the experiments were actually run. And this was to separate the start location and the goal location in the actual experiment. So we identified the north location, shown in blue, as the place where the animals had to go to eat the food. These are large pellets. They'll always carry them. Now, they may start in the south, as shown in the first uh, cartoon. They may start in the east, as shown in the second. Or they may start in the west, as shown in the third. But in every case, as soon as they left the start box, we closed the door such that they couldn't come back there. And even though, as shown very clearly in Ian Wishaw's experiments, they love to carry the food back to the starting location, and that's been the way in which most people have thought about path integration, we are forcing the animals now to carry the food somewhere else. They get pretty cross, actually. They don't like it. <laughs> but they, you know, finally um, read the rule book and, and do what they're supposed to do. So, um, oops, excuse me, let me just see if I can persuade you how this works. Here we go, a little movie. So here's sample trial one, encoding. The rat's in the south, the door opens automatically. And he now doesn't know where the sand well is, so he goes searching for it. He's running around this arena. He tends to look all over the place, actually. Um, and... Um, kind of, where is it, where is it, right? Checks out the, another door. Ah, got it, all right? Digs, collects the food and goes up to north like that, and uh, then that door closes, okay? So now we have sample two. This is now happening about 30 seconds later. Rat comes out, has a little think. He's a good boy, goes up to that corner, digs for the food, and scurries off to north. Okay? So now comes the choice trial, now in a third location. I think it's now in west. And now we've got our six different um, positions. The animal perhaps checks out one. He's, you know, he's not performing perfectly, but he does pretty well, goes to the right point, um, and then carries it back. So I, I don't think there's any kind of combination of vectors from path integration which would enable the animal to perform this. So I think what we've developed is a procedure which ensures a, a slightly more allocentric way of going. So let me just move on very quickly. What about post-encoding novelty? So using actually the original procedure, we added five-minute periods of novelty exploration at a time point 30 minutes after memory encoding. And we did that through a just big box with interchangeable floor surfaces here to sustain novelty across several presentations, which are given about every two weeks or something like that. So here's just with white paper. We have ball bearings or logo, uh, Lego bricks or, or, you know, British labs. We had tea leaves, you know, that kind of sort of thing. <laughs> now, if you do that 30 minutes after encoding, then what happens, as you can see in the panel at the bottom, is now, 24 hours later, the animals remember perfectly well. And what I want to put to you is that that novelty is a bit like the strong tetanization in the LTP experiments. It's upregulating the availability of plasticity proteins. It's not providing specific information about where the sand well should be. It's simply stabilizing an otherwise transient memory of that location. And moreover, it's sensitive to shearing 23390 given before and to anisomycin. So this is a dopamine-dependent protein synthesis dependent kind of process. So as one does nowadays, we decided to try to go after the cells that might be mediating this, guided a little bit by Lisman and Grace's model, thinking it might be VTA. And we switched the entire experiment to mouse. We worked with TH Cree mice, uh, into which we put channel rhodopsin bilaterally into either VTA or LC or both. And uh, Adrian Duskovitz, the physiologist in the project, built Carl Dysteros Optetrode and actually recorded um, uh, uh, in LC and VTA during uh, exposures to a familiar environment and exposures to a novel environment. And what he found, somewhat surprisingly, 
is we had expected we'd see an effect primarily in VTA, he actually saw a much larger effect in locus cerealis, and this habituates nicely over five minutes. We also went on and did anterograde tracing um, by uh, expressing EYFP with the channel rhodopsin, and in collaboration with Watanabe's group in Hokkaido, we're able to observe that the locus cerealis afferents um, are really quite robust in the hippocampus, but the afferents from the VTA is very modest. So then comes the critical experiment, which is can we now replace the novelty explanation by just driving the locus cerealis? And we did this with a pattern which was similar to what you see in the literature, but also guided a little by Adrian's physiology. And lo and behold, you don't have to have novelty. You can just simply drive the LC at these patterns for five minutes, and then you get nice 24-hour memory later. So it looks as though that activation is su sufficient to stabilize those changes. But an interesting puzzle is, although we're dr driving the LC, uh, what we observe is that this is insensitive to propranolol, but sensitive to shearing 23390. So this raises the possibility that noradrenergic afferents into the hippocampus may well actually be releasing dopamine. So, um, shortly after we published this paper, Eric Kandel's group, using HPLC, were able to actually see a small dopamine signal um, in a similar kind of experiment. Uh, but of course, the time course for HPLC is somewhat uh, elongated, five or 10 minutes or so. And so we have teamed up with David Kleinfeld down at the University of California, San Diego, in the physics department, who together with Slovenger has developed things called sniffers which are HEC-493 cells expressing either a D2 receptor or an alpha-1A receptor, and using a FRET signal are able to actually measure over quite short time scales of 60 to 90 seconds changes. And we hope to use this technique to try to establish definitively whether LC activation does release dopamine in the hippocampus. So I've used up pretty much all my time, so I'm just going to touch very briefly, if I may, Two, two or three minutes, is that, is that okay? On um, systems consolidation schemas. So really this is the question of who guides who. Is it the hippocampus, who's the fat controller, um, telling the neocortex what to do, or might there be circumstances in which there's some top-down influence? Now listening to Bruce this morning, I think my sense of his theoretical position was he sort of thinks it's both, and I, if so, I, I share that view. But what we have tried to do is to develop some new experiments which would look at that. And we're back to our old friend, um, the event arena. And here it is now with six different sand wells. Um, but the difference now is instead of the location of the food moving around every day, what we have is lots of different flavors of rat food. And they remain stably in each location across days. So rum-flavored rat uh, food was in location one strawberry in location two, ginger in location three, banana, chocolate. It's an American food company, so we had pina colada as well. <laughs> now, if you make a hippocampal lesion, the animals cannot learn this task, um, but normal animals can, but it takes them quite a long time. It's a slow learning process. But they will learn it, and here's the kind of learning curve you get over a period of about six weeks. We put in our non cued control, make sure the animals go to chance, and try to control the experiments as carefully as possible. And then comes a key test in which we now try to change the schema such that instead of using those six flavors, we'll take away two of them and put in two new flavors. And what we find is that even though it's taken the animals six weeks to learn this schema, they can learn these two new flavors uh, within one day and one trial as shown in the data in panel C. Moreover, if you now make hippocampal lesions either three hours or 48 hours after these two new flavors, then what you find is that if you do it three hours after the two new flavors introduced, then what happens is the hippocampal lesion animals are a chance when tested two weeks later. But if you wait 48 hours before doing the hippocampal lesion, then you see this upward uh, function that reflects systems consolidation. Now the final little new bits of data, or relatively new bits of data I wanted to share with you, is the experimental design for encoding related immediate early gene activation in the neocortex, because we wanted to hunt for where things might be happening in neocortex. So we take our animals through habituation, pre-training, teach them the original flavors of a schema, 
And then comes a critical session in which we'll sacrifice the animals 90 minutes after the critical bit of training. And some of the animals just have the original paired associates. Some have completely uh, new map, shown in red. Some were home caged. Um, but uh, one group of animals had just the two new paired associates, which we have shown that they can successfully assimilate into a schema. And the more detailed design is one in which the four original paired, paired associates, or the two, four new ones for the new map group, are done over for trials T1, T2, T3, T4. Then we have a three-hour gap, and then we do the two new ones, and then we kill the animals 90 minutes later. And for me, the interesting result to emerge from this is that when we look at histochemistry for ZIF and ARC, we see a bimodal, a, a, an inverted U-shaped function, uh, which is perhaps best captured in this enlarged thing. So what's happening is that uh, the baseline position from the home cage is 100%, but that if you just make the animals reiterate the old paired associates, the nothing new to learn, then you do get a slight elevation um, of, of ZIF and of ARC, not, not very much. It's significant, but it's nothing really to write home about. If you have an entirely new map, you also get an elevation, but again, it doesn't differ from the old pet associate's condition. But the new pet associate condition is the one that interests me most because this is the one where the animals have a schema and we're just asking them to incorporate two new bits of information into this framework. And that's the one that really drives ARC suggesting that the cortical immediate early gene activation is in some way associated with the assimilation process uh, rather than anything else. And we're now going on to look at um, uh, correlations between um, ac activity and, say, ACC and, and uh, prelimbic cortex, a number of other brain areas, and following the lovely work of Ann Wheeler with Paul Franklin, uh, build um, kind of maps which will tell us about these patterns of connectivity uh, based on immediate early gene activation. Now, just in the interest of transparency, I think it's important for me to say that schema studies in animals are difficult, they're extremely time-consuming, and they're not always re easy to replicate. And in my own laboratory, um, uh, one person has consistently been able to get the experiment to work, Dorothy Say, um, uh, Suhan Wang also, but not everybody in the lab can get it to work. And that raises you know, the possibility that there might be some artifact, and we've discussed this extensively. But uh, we're working on that, and we think the new uh, North uh, Gold Box procedure will help us. Uh, but I am pleased to say that there have been some dramatic human studies from Guillaume Fernandez's lab at the Donda Center in Nijmegen, um, some by Malika van Kesteren, who's here at the meeting, uh, in which she's looked at stigma-dependent coding in relation to academic performance. Uh, Marit van Ruren in a, an experimentally learned schema. Isabella Wagner, who's also here, uh, <laughs> emphasizing the role of the angular gyrus, and Mareka van der Linden. Uh, wonderful work. So, to summarize, I tried to explain to you this kind of funny idea of silent learning, and what I would want to leave with you is the idea that perhaps self-firing can sometimes play less of a role in memory encoding uh, than we previously thought. With respect to the novelty associated enhancement of retention, perhaps cellular consolidation acts as a kind of low-pass filter into systems consolidation and replay, helping to limit the burden during sleep. Most stuff gets lost, therefore will not be subject to systems consolidation but in the ways I've described, you can maybe select out a few things that might be then worth being subject to systems consolidation. And with respect to prior knowledge, I think the huge impact of prior knowledge on the manner in which we assimilate and update semantic memory is a kind of growth area, and one um, I know, particularly with the human studies, is building up very nicely. So here are some of the guys and girls of my lab. Sadly, Dorothy's not in the picture, uh, but Tominori and Adrian, who did the Locus Cerulea study, uh, Lisa, who did some of the studies, Mio Nonaka, and lots of other people uh, to thank. But let me just end, uh, if I may, with a coda. One last slide. So we began this meeting with Jim telling us all how important memory was and what a key part of um, life it is uh, in lots of, uh, of different ways. And I'd like to end by, by echoing that. Uh, when we go home and our friends who are outside of science you know, tell us, ask us what we've been doing, we say we've been to a truly amazing meeting on memory, and it's 
perhaps one of the most important things in your life. Because memory enables us to transcend the immediate moment, to travel mentally in time. It's central to our own individual identity, to everyday family life, to science, to literature, as I showed you in the poem, visual arts, music. It's fallible, as we heard this morning, but it's still a foundation stone of human culture that binds communities together. And I think it was never better expressed than by your own Abraham Lincoln, who after the end of the Civil War in his second inaugural address, shortly before he died, said on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, we are not enemies but friends. And though passion may have been strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone will yet swell the chorus of the Union. Thank you.